Hey guys, welcome to our Facebook Live for Autism Awareness Month. I'm Grace, I'm your host, and I am here today with two really special guests. We have Dr. Borman and Dr. DeWitt, and we're gonna talk all things autism. I know that there are a lot of questions out there around this, um, and so if you have specific questions, please type them in the comments and we will answer them live um, or get back to you after the broadcast. So thank you guys for being here. Sure. So yes. before we get into the questions, can you guys introduce yourself and tell me what makes you an expert on this topic? Go ahead, Dr. All right, yeah. I'm uh, Craig Borman. I'm a developmental pediatrician. Um, what that means is I uh, did training in pediatrics, went on, did additional three years studying uh, childhood development and behavior. And one of the main areas that we cover in fellowship is uh, autism spectrum disorders. And then I spent the last 15 uh, years practicing medicine, both in the Air Force and now here at Dayton Children's, um, specifically working in the autism clinic, autism center, doing diagnostic and, and helping kids and families. Uh, that have been affected by autism. Great. And I'm Mary Beth DeWitt. I've been here about 20 years. I'm a clinical psychologist by training, and I have worked um, here at the hospital doing primarily developmental and behavioral assessments with the developmental pediatricians. Um, worked extensively in autism assessment and, and, and treatment. Um, when I did my training, I worked at a center for people with developmental disabilities where we specialized in taking care of people with disabilities and more specifically autism spectrum mm -hmm. disorders. Perfect. Awesome. So we, we really have two amazing experts here today to, talk, to touch on this topic and we're going to go through a lot of things. So let's start with one of the more controversial things around this. So what do we know what causes autism? Do vaccines cause autism? Is there something else that causes autism? Where does it come from? You want me to take Why that don't one? We start, Dr. Sure. Mormon, sure. So the the easy answer, but also the hard answer is we don't know, to yeah. be honest. Uh, so uh, that's a, that's an area that people are looking at, and what we're finding is that really autism is not one disorder, but rather a collection of things that we call autism. Because at the end of the day, autism is a clinical diagnosis, meaning that uh, a, a doctor, a psychologist, uh, someone that specializes in autism takes a look at the child, and based on what they hear from the family, what they see in the clinic. They make that diagnosis based on behaviors mm -hmm. and, and, and the way the child is uh, behaving, not on any blood test or x-rays or anything like that. So it's different than some other medical diagnosis. Right. Um, and therefore, there's multiple things that could be causing autism. Okay. Um, now when we look at what is, you know, what our best guess is or what research is telling us, we think that about roughly 90% of the time, it's likely has something to do with genetics. Okay. Um, the main reason people think that is that there are uh, numerous studies looking at like twins that have been separated at birth for whatever reason, mm. so they have the exact same uh, copies of their DNA, so their yeah. genes are exactly the same, but they're raised in different environments, so they have a whole different experience of life, Yeah. and the likelihood of those twins who are raised separately, uh, of ha both having autism, is, is very high. Okay. Um, so that leads us to think, okay, there's definitely something going on from a genetic standpoint. Yeah. Um, and then we're also recently, and there's a lot of a lot of research going on right now in this area, looking at genetics. We're finding multiple uh, uh, areas of the of the genome or the DNA yeah. that are associated with autism, um, and that's the really the big impact or the big thing we're looking at is what do those areas mean? But we're finding that people that have variations or mutations right. in the DNA in certain sections. Um, oftentimes have autism if they okay. have those changes. Okay. Um, now, and what about vaccines? Yeah, so vaccines wise, that's been something that we've been looking at for a long time. Mm -hmm. Really a lot of the concerns for vaccines and, and I guess, the, the, I guess the, the quick and easy answer is no, we've not been able to find any link between vaccines and autism when we do good research. Yeah. Now there was a study back, uh, it's a very popular and, and famous study um, coming out of England um, right. with Andrew Wakefield Back in 1998, he published a paper linking specifically MMR to uh, the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine to developing autism. Um, and since then, people have tried to repeat that because that's right. what we do in science is if someone finds something, we want to repeat that and see if that's just a fluke or if it's a true causation. No one else has been able to find that right. link. Um, and in fact, unfortunately, for many families and also for all the money and time that was spent on research, uh, it was found that uh, Mr. And Mr. Wakefield falsified the data. He didn't mm. just have do bad science, which would be unfortunate. He actually made data up, right. which uh, has led a lot of families to be concerned, a lot of families to wonder if they cause problems for their children. Um, and, and then, of course, like I said, we've done a lot of research to try to look at that, and that's a lot of money that's been spent, which could have been spent yeah. at something more useful right. for kids. Right. Um, 
And uh, so after, you know, tw uh, what are we now, 30 years so, or 20 years 20 away? 20 years, yeah. Um, we've not found anything. So I think yeah. as, as conclusively as we can say, of course, we can never prove absolutely right. or disprove But it absolutely. hasn't been able to have been shown Nothing's again. Nothing's been yeah. shown. Yeah. Um, and a lot of folks have been looking at it. Yeah, that that's point. important. What I think is really wonderful about the research, too, in the evolving science is that it used to be thought that autism was caused by parenting techniques yeah. and that parents just weren't engaged with their child. But since then, we've learned that that didn't contribute at all. It's something neurochemically, neurodevelopmentally yeah. um, involved that we don't fully understand, but we know it's nothing the parents have done wrong, and truly the parents that we work with are some of the most amazing parents I've ever met in my yeah, life. Yeah, so. I think that's a really important distinction. So we did get a question um, from Laura Beth, who's watching. Thanks for watching, Laura Beth. So the question is, my four-year-old is nonverbal, but now saying all her ABCs and saying words. Is it possible for her to become verbal? I think that suggests that she is saying words mm -hmm. in the ABCs that she is verbal, so it's just a matter of learning to use her words to communicate her needs and encourage her to use words to ask for things and to comment on things and, and to really reinforce that um, language when she uses it. Yeah, yeah. and that's a great segue into what are, you know, if I'm, I'm a parent and I'm wondering, A, when should I start looking for symptoms, mm -hmm. at what age? And then B, what are those symptoms and signs that I should be looking for? Sure. I think that the symptom that comes to our attention soonest is language development. Mm -hmm. So autism is, is characterized by three primary areas of concern. One is communication deficits, one is social skills and social deficits, and one is our repetitive behaviors and interests. So usually that communication delay is what comes to our attention first. And usually parents will bring that up with their pediatrician who then will refer them to us for additional assessment. So anytime you have a 12 to 18 month old that's not using words and not trying to develop or communicate, then that's a red flag that maybe you want to talk to your primary care doctor about that um, and look into it further. Other things that we sometimes see in kids with autism is um, limited eye contact. So they may not be as socially connected with us as we would expect them to. Mm -hmm. They may not be looking at us. They may not be trying to direct our attention to share in something they're excited about. So looking at something, looking back to their parent, and looking back to that to share in that interaction. You may not see appropriate toy play. So most kids will play with toys the way they're intended to be played with, by pushing the car or throwing the ball. Kids with autism may be more interested in, in spinning the wheels on the cars or not not playing it with the way it was intended to be okay. played with. Okay. Okay. And if, and, and if families are concerned, there's a couple of great uh, places they can go to look yep. for early mm -hmm. uh, warning signs. Mm -hmm. okay. One is the CDC.gov website, which is Learn the Signs, Act Early. Um, that's a, a nice uh, website that lists out basically. Uh, it's kind of like a growth chart. We look at, you know, when you go in for your well baby checks, the doctor always checks the weight and the height. Right. This measures the growth and progress of social skills and language okay. skills to help with that. Um, and the other one would be Autism Speaks, which is AutismSpeaks.org. They have a lot, they have early warning signs that parents can look at. And if they have any concerns, certainly would have them talk to their, uh, their doctor, their healthcare provider, um, and uh, see if the referral is necessary or if they need an evaluation. Great. Uh, if you're just joining us, we are talking about everything autism today. It is Autism Awareness Month in April, so lots of things going on with that. Um, and we just kind of talked through some of those signs and symptoms. So, like you said, probably the first step if they think something is talk to their primary care physician, talk mm -hmm. to a pediatrician, and then they might get referred. We have a diagnostic center mm -hmm. here at Dayton Children's, mm -hmm. um, and I think that we always get a lot of questions, well, what happens at that diagnostic yeah. center? So can you kind of talk through that? Sure, sure. So um, right now, because of the size of our program, we have um, we accept kids up to age five. We find that if we can capture kids as early as possible, that's one of the hallmarks of improving outcomes is to uh, get kids identified early. Um, so kids up to age five um, can get referred in. What typically happens um, is they'll see one of our nurse practitioners who's spent three years doing just uh, autism screening. That's her primary role. And she gets down on the floor, she plays with the kids and looks for the signs that Dr. DeWitt was talking about. How the child plays, what the language like, is like, how they interact with, with a relative stranger, with the nurse practitioner, um, and then of course hearing what families are, are concerned about. Um, about half the time, a little less than half the time, we're finding that the concern is not actually autism, mm. but almost 100% of the time we're finding some developmental issue, whether that be a language delay or a global developmental delay or something. And so those kids, rather than waiting a long time to get in to see a team of folks, they get to uh, get in faster and typically the appointments with our nurse practitioners are occurring within a week or two. 
Um, and if they don't have that diagnosis of autism, then they get referred off to appropriate services like Help Me Grow through the county, okay. or if they're old enough, then through the school or maybe private therapies as needed. Um, if there is a concern um, for autism, then the nurse practitioner will send the child on to see the team, and that's going to be a developmental pediatrician and a, a psychologist working together, taking that history again from the family, hearing what those concerns are, what the family's seeing at home and in the environment, and then we'll do some assessments looking at the child's developmental kind of cognitive abilities, adaptive abilities, which is how they problem solve, but then also doing specific testing if needed for looking at their social skills to see, you know, are these are these uh, difficulties the child child is having uh, a result of autism. Okay, yeah. great. Um, so hopefully, does this question yeah, we're going to ask this a, is great. A, a new, another question from Laura Beth? Um, a follow up question. So, what are your thoughts on? Is it just ABA or is it ABA? ABA. ABA. Yeah, ABA. Yeah, okay. So. So what is ABA? Yeah. ABA is, is an, an, a behavioral <laughs> intervention strategy. So it stands for Applied Behavior Analysis. And it's, it's a technique that's grounded in learning theory, uh, suggesting that if we um, teach and reward appropriate behaviors, they're more likely to occur in the future. So what ABA does is breaks skills down into small teachable units, teaches those little units um, repetitively over and over again, and then links them to, together in larger responses. It's based on a play format, so it's really fun for the kids and energized and um, enjoyable um, for mm -hmm. most involved. So it, it's a great technique. There's a lot of empirical research to suggest mm -hmm. that it makes a big difference in building skills in children with autism and truly ch all children altogether and people across the board benefit from intensive behavioral services. Yeah. Great. And especially uh, related to the previous question yeah. where uh, Laura Beth said her child is developing some words now or at least right. some, some ABCs and some, some verbal right. skills. Mm -hmm. ABA would be a great way to help um, grow those from being just words and, and you know individual things to being something where there's a communication because that's the next step yep. and the ABA is really good at that so certainly would have you look into that there's a lot of good agencies in uh, Dayton that uh, do ABA um, and if uh, they can contact our office and even if we haven't seen the child we can make sure they get information Stay about connected. ABA. Yeah. Okay great Absolutely. so speaking of some of those treatment options what are some like myths you hear or maybe parents come in and say I heard that you know this was a great example of you saying yeah that's mm -hmm. a great option what are some things maybe you hear that you would just say no that's not really you know something we should that we see working for yeah. treating I it. think there's so many out there of things yeah. that, that may or may you not pick work your top so, or something. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I think what's important as a, as a parent and a consumer of, of um, services that might be out there is to do your research to yeah. really look in to see have there been studies conducted mm -hmm. to see that this makes a difference is there data to suggest that it makes a difference or um, is it just a parent saying this worked for my child and that's what you really want to understand is what has been supported by the data so behavioral interventions make a huge difference early yeah. intervention in, in school settings make a huge difference um, Play, being around other children <laughs> with social models makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of things that we want to do, and we really want to invest our energy in the things that have been supported that in we the know research work. that we yeah. know work yeah. rather than um, kind of pursue some of the other options. What I usually tell parents is if it makes sense, then research it a little bit yeah. more. If it doesn't make sense to you conceptually, then you might want to ask your doctor or your specialist about questions if this is right for my child or not. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's great. I mean, my top two, I'd say my first one is something Dr. DeWitt brought up earlier is, uh, unfortunately, and, and we as physicians and psychologists have to take credit, I guess, for this, is back in the 50s and 60s, we used to say parents caused autism. Mm. That was the, the refrigerator mother was the term that they used, which is horrible to think about now because that's absolutely not true. So that's one of the myths still that may be left unsaid. A lot yeah. of parents that will come in will kind of be blaming themselves and wondering what did I do wrong? What did I not do? Or what did I do during pregnancy or during the early childhood development? And what we found is that, that parents don't cause autism. Autism is something that starts before you're even born. It's part of the way the brain develops and it develops in a different way. And so certainly, you know, parents can have a positive influence on their child. Right. Um, and unfortunately, being a parent myself, I know I can have negative influence <laughs> on my children, but we're not going to cause autism. Right. And in fact, that's one of the things I brought is there's some uh, really cool research from last year that talked about um, quite the opposite is that 
parent participation in early intervention has definitely shown to have greater outcomes than if we just send the child to a therapist. Mm. So we know parents make a huge difference in how their child uh, is going to develop and grow and give parents those skills and techniques to help kind of push that along. Like example with Laura Beth, like how to move from saying ABCs to saying words and then communicating. That's, that's, if the yeah. parent can learn that, that's going to be great. So that's myth number, that's my big, yeah, big, big myth one, number one. Yeah. Yeah. And then the other one is, is kind of a, a catch-all of just um, things that we don't know. So like uh, food diet changes, um, the, uh, using different vitamins or restrictive diets and things like that. We don't have evidence to show that works, but honestly, we don't have evidence to show it doesn't, it doesn't work. Right. In my own practice, I've seen both sides of the of the story happen. I've seen a, a gluten's a big example right. that's oftentimes yes. uh, utilized uh, to treat to treat uh, symptoms of autism. I, I've seen majority of the time when families try that, they either are unable to keep the diet or they tried it and nothing changes mm-hmm. at all. Um, I've seen a few instances though where families have changed that diet and there's been a big that's change great. in the behavior. Now, was that from the change in the, beha- the diet itself? Was it because the family was paying a lot more attention to the child because they needed to do this special diet? Was there other things? Because usually other therapies were going on. I don't know. But the family was happy with it and they went for it. So generally speaking, and like Dr. DeWitt was saying, you want to do your research. But the other thing that I talk about is with, with families is, one, make sure it's safe and not going to harm the child. There are some things out there that are actually harmful. And if you don't know that it works, I wouldn't do it. Yeah. Um, that's 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 uh, going down a dangerous path. Right. Secondly, is to consider the costs, um, not just the monetary costs, but the time and energy as well. We only have a certain amount of time and energy during the day, mm-hmm. and if you're a parent, you know you have very limited energy after all the stuff you have to do. And if you have a child with disabilities, you know you even less energy. So yeah. make sure you're you're uh, prioritizing those appropriately. And, and saying, is this worth my effort? Is this worth the energy? Is this worth the time? Because if I do this, then I won't have time to do something else. So like, right. for example, if I go and do a special um, uh, diet therapy and I can't do ABA because of that, I would say you probably need to be thinking about ABA because we know that works. No, it works, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's great. So let's talk a little bit about the spectrum. I mean, we hear autism spectrum disorder and like you were saying earlier, it really is kind of this mm-hmm. wide range. So. What, you know, what is that spectrum? What are we seeing from one end to the other in in kids? There's so much variability because our development, um, there's so many different domains of our development. We have how we learn, how we think, how we speak, how we adapt to our environment. So there's lots of variation on all of those areas and every individual varies along all of those areas. So that's what contributes to the spectrum. Additionally, kids will vary on the severity of their symptoms and so that's how we help identify the spectrum. Some kids are very mildly affected, so they may be okay in social environments and be comfortable in them. Others may be less comfortable and may have difficulty in in meltdowns or tantrums when they're in different social environments. So we as professionals have to work with the families to determine what their strengths and weaknesses are and how we can help meet those needs that they have across that spectrum of of symptoms. Okay, that's great. Um, How, if, you know, we have people watching that don't have a child with autism, they just mm-hmm. want to know more about this, mm-hmm. but maybe they have a child who doesn't have autism and maybe they have a classmate that mm-hmm. has autism mm-hmm. or a cousin or a neighbor or whatever. How can um, parents talk to their kids about interacting with a child with autism? Yeah, I think conversations about diversity and mm-hmm. differences in our world are, are so important to have regardless. We all are individuals and that was, that's what makes the world a wonderful place to be. And so we want to have those conversations with our kids regardless of if they have a disability or not. Um, and that helps uh, our children learn that it's okay to accept. We should accept. We should mm-hmm. embrace change. We should embrace difference and accept people for who they are regardless of if their hair color is different, if they have autism, or if they have some other disability. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you have any suggestions for how to explain what that means to you know a kid mm-hmm. is that you know mm-hmm. I was talking with someone else that said you know yeah my good friend has a child with autism and here's how I kind of explained to my kids what that meant why when we were around him that he was acting this way so what are your suggestions on how yeah. to explain that because it is different than you know if they're in a wheelchair or something right. it's very easy right. to say well they're in a wheelchair because of x right. Right. this is right. a little bit different so how right. would you explain that 
to a kid? I usually just say we're all different and some kids have difficulty with other things. So this little guy might have difficulty with the noise that, that's going on around mm -hmm. us. So they may cover their ears and they may cry a little bit. But that's okay. His mom's there to help him and we'll get him to a safe place and he'll be okay. Um, yeah. and so I just really try to look at the symptoms that they're having and just again explain that we're all different. We all have our strengths and weaknesses and, and we just have to embrace them and accept them. Yeah. yeah. It makes it a difficult question too because kids are all different and they are. like some have the real uh, uh, high sensory needs and so the, the you know the, the the friend may be asking why why does the child wear a you know headset or but other times it may be that they're not playing with anybody and so one thing that you can ask you know, I think a parent of a child without autism if they have someone in their class or whatever can talk about is you know if you see Johnny over there and, and might want to check with the teacher or the parent of the child first to make sure is it okay to approach and ask because mm. that child may not know how to engage right but that's actually another myth of autism is that kids with autism this is the myth don't have feelings and don't want to engage they they don't they they, they don't have that drive that we have um they don't often express feelings in some cases but they absolutely have feelings of right. course they do yeah. right um and so they may they may enjoy playing with with someone else but they don't naturally approach and ask for that so right. it may be great for someone to become like a, a mentor or a buddy and that would be a great thing for especially like a teacher to be able to work out because the teacher I'm assuming an older child the teacher is going to see how that activity is going on in the classroom and know well maybe this child would be a good fit for this or if it's not in the school situation a parent can always say I know my child best I know the types of kids they like to hang out with set up some yeah. play dates and, yeah. and then kind of be there to coach when difficulties happen yeah. Um, that's oftentimes the best time to, to kind of as, as things come up. Yeah. But have the conversation. Yeah. It's so important to yes. have the conversation about. Mm -hmm. Don't ignore it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because yeah. a lot of people will, you know, when we yeah. were kids, we were sometimes told, don't look, oh, look don't away. Talk, yeah. right. um, but we really want to ask questions and we yeah. want to encourage our kids to ask questions so we can help them understand. A lot of the problems and the myths that we have mm -hmm. is because people don't understand yeah. how to help and how yeah. to interact. Yeah. yeah. For those watching who maybe do have a child with autism or once again know somebody with it, um, what is your encouragement usually, and I realize that once again it depends on where they are on the spectrum, mm -hmm. but as far as what what the, what their future looks like, as far as because going into adulthood, getting a job, doing these things that everyone else does, what, what do you usually tell parents to hope I think for? there's so much variability and I wish I had a crystal ball to be yeah. able to predict that with every child, but my goal with every child I see and my own children is that they're happy, healthy, productive as they grow mm -hmm. older. Yeah. And so our goal is to make your child, help your child be the best person that they can be. Yeah. And so we're going to encourage them and we're going to um, meet those needs that they have to help them develop and grow. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. It, it's hard to know exactly. Most people with autism wouldn't choose my job where I talk to people all day. It right. wouldn't be comfortable right. for them, but they can find employment. They can find their niche in life where they fit in. Yeah, right. that's great. And actually, I brought a, a news article. Yeah. Uh, I mm -hmm. pulled this out. This is perfect. That this is from um, the Wright Patterson uh, uh, based newspaper. Oh, cool. And it's a collaboration between Wright Patterson and Wright State. Um, where they're helping uh, graduates from Wright State, so college graduates. So there's an, uh, somewhat of an answer to the question. Yeah. Certainly having autism means doesn't mean you can't go to a college or yeah. go to school. Um, so kids that have, or adult, young adults, excuse me, that have uh, autism, they're helping them to navigate kind of those social difficulties mm -hmm. like an interview when they may graduate with a degree that's super useful in like a technical field or right. something that they have a really good interest. And oftentimes, although not always, but oftentimes uh, individuals with autism are much more detail oriented than yeah. you or I might be. And so they're well suited for some of these careers and they're going to love it. But they've got to get through this weird, awkward, which I think is weird and awkward social act, you know, interaction with a with a interview. interview. Yeah. And so what Wright State's doing, and it, this is brand new, literally last week, uh, this article came out um, of them helping to mentor through. And there's uh, uh, folks from the base and from Wright State that are working together, collaborating That's on this. That's awesome. So it's pretty exciting. Yeah. So, uh, you know, especially for kids um, or parents that have older kids, if they're thinking about college, if that's something that's in, in their child's future, then um, look into that. And, yeah. And, and hopefully more in the future, more schools will be doing this as well. Yeah, that's really great. That's a great example. So I feel like, you know, in, in recent years, we keep, I feel like every year the number changes. It's one in X, whatever. Mm -hmm. Like it used to be one in 110 or something, right. and then yep. maybe one in 88, and now it's one in 68, yep. I think. Yep. Um, so, what is your guys' opinion? It are are we just diagnosing it better and more, or are more kids actually getting it? Mm -hmm. 
I think we're better at diagnosing some of the higher functioning children. So um, the kids who are more mildly affected by autism, we may not have diagnosed five, 10 years ago. And so now we're better at identifying the symptoms and spending more time with the child um, to explore those symptoms more in depth. So I think we're better diagnostically and that has made a big difference. And we're better at accepting higher functioning ends of the spectrum. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if you know. Um, yeah, I, th I, I love the history of medicine and seeing where we've come and trying to prevent the mistakes, you know, that's why we try to learn history. And so looking at what has gone on in, in the history of autism and how we've defined it even has mm -hmm. changed over time. So the original definitions for autism back um, when it was first kind of being thought about and discussed um, were really the more severe children, uh, right. you know, children that had not only autism, but really severe cognitive deficits, um, behavioral issues and things like that. Whereas now, with, especially with the spectrum and with a few years ago with the removal of Asperger's disorder as a no longer a term, but that's kind of been pulled into that, that's really increased what we call autism. So that alone is going to increase the, the diagnosis. We're better at diagnosing it. We're diagnosing it earlier. Mm -hmm. So so there's, there's kind of that. Um, that would cause an increase too because we're just catching kids earlier, which is yeah. great. Um, but also, uh, parents are more aware. The, I, I don't think there's much, you know, there's not very many other developmental disabilities that get as much press time as autism, which is yeah. great because parents are looking for it. They come in, they talk to their doctor or provider about it, and then they get a diagnosis earlier too. So I think that's yeah. part of it as well. Whereas before, people would just say, oh, he's just different. I'm just going to leave it alone. And even if they did bring it into a pediatrician, or even one of us back, you know, 20 years ago, that that recognition right. wouldn't have been the same. Right. So there's a lot of change that's been going on. Yeah. Okay. Can you outgrow autism? Mm, that's a, I think your symptoms can absolutely yes. diminish over time. Yes. Okay. Um, yes. So again, our goal is to decrease those symptoms so that you don't look like you have autism yes. in, right. in, in, in just the, in the general population. Yep. Um, I don't believe those core features go away entirely. I think mm -hmm. the individuals continue to be challenged by those areas, right. but we can build the skills to help them cope and, and to be yep. successful. Yep. Yeah. And there's even some good research on that too, where they took uh, groups of kids that had autism that um, kind of grew out of, that's a hard term to use because it's not really grown out of, but they, yeah. they improved they to improved. the point where they, they were indistinguishable from yeah. others. And a group of kids that had never been diagnosed with autism, but had siblings with autism. so. Uh, kind of as a control group, and then kids that um, just were considered to be high functioning autism or or, or low uh, low severity autism, and they looked at how those kids did in young in uh, young adulthood and early or late adolescence, and actually the kids that kind of outgrew looked closer to the kids that were typically developing than the kids that with high functioning autism, just on general mm. performance and whatnot, and you know how they were doing in life. But then when you started really digging in there, or like someone that was a professional with autism started asking these two questions, then the differences started coming out. But the, but to the average person walking around, no, no yeah. problems at all. Yeah. So it, it really depends. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and the exciting thing is, um, you know, we're, since we're identifying kids earlier and we know that early intervention makes a huge difference, it's kind of hard to compare because we're talking about, you know, we see kids that are two, three, four, five, six. 20 years from now, they're going to be young adults. So right. the kids that are young adults now, those kids were young 20 years ago when we didn't do early didn't interventions. Do it. Right. So it's hard to know what's going to exactly. what it's going to be. So, yeah. but thankfully, the future is brighter than yeah. than it was before because mm -hmm. we we know more now. Yeah, that's great. Is there any other kind of new research? in this field around autism that you think is important to note? Yeah, I, I brought a list. Cause, oh, good. Cause, and this is actually, <laughs> I'll, I'll give credit where credit is due. This is from Autism Speaks. I mentioned it before, autismspeaks.org. This is their top um, uh, research articles from 2017. Oh, great. So it just talks about things in, in general. Um, I mentioned the one about uh, parent participation in early intervention. Mm -hmm. um, I think all of us that work with kids with autism know that is the case, but it's nice to see um, some pretty big articles looking at a large group of children showing that um, by and far, having parents involved with that early intervention, with the ABA, with, with you know, just being involved overall can only improve the outcomes. Yeah. Uh, no, no, no surprise there. And then the other big area that's really growing, and quite honestly, I feel like we're in the frontier land uh, of this, is the genetics uh, research. Mm. So I mentioned before that we're finding a lot of different areas on the, in the DNA um, that are associated with autism, and now the big task for researchers is to say, what does that gene do? Why does mm -hmm. that lead to the symptoms that we cause uh, that we call autism? 
Um, and so that's kind of exciting because there's potential in that to find an actual treatment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right now, all of our treatment is therapy and helping with symptoms, yeah. but there's a potential at some point down the road, and that's what I'm hoping to see, yeah. is that we'll be able to say, oh, this gene led to this protein that doesn't work anymore. If we can just modify the gene or if we can replace that protein, yeah. will we see some drastic improvements? Yeah. Um, and, and perhaps then tailor the treatments more yeah. specifically. So if there's different markers, then we may provide different treatments based yeah. on that genetic markers. Yeah, so. exactly. that's great. So there's a bunch there, but it's still very, very new and very mm -hmm. kind of foundational work yeah. that's going on. So our understanding is only going to get better, but it's yeah. early on and it's not happening fast enough. Yeah. And I'm sure so since there is a lot of that <laughs> research around the around the genetics around yeah. this, do most kids, and I don't know if it's most or just some, how, I guess I should say, how often are kids, um, they maybe get a diagnosis of autism, seeing a genetic counselor mm -hmm. and having that so tested? So here, here at Dayton Children's, and I'm pretty sure this is pretty consistent amongst yeah. any children's hospital that has an autism clinic or, or, or works with kids with autism, we recommend it to every family. Okay. That's a recommendation from the American College of Medical Genetics, from the American Academy of Pediatrics, is that all children with a diagnosis of autism should have genetic testing done. Now they may not have to meet with a geneticist, but we should get the kind of okay. initial test done. Okay. Um, and then of course there's always, because there's so much research going on, there's always research looking at, you know, if there is a finding right. or even if the family say couldn't uh, afford or, or their insurance doesn't cover the cost of that genetic testing, they can go and get uh, that done perhaps at a- it's Like at a clinical a, study or mm -hmm. something yep. like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. that's as interesting. As long as it's done at a reputable place, fantastic yeah I, you know i encourage families to do that um, but of course that's an individual decision right right great well is there anything else that you guys want to touch on that i didn't think to ask you today about this topic i think this was really good conversation no so is this list of research articles you got that on autism speaks website autism so speaks. maybe you can send me that and we could share that in the yep. comments yep. Yep. so Absolutely. people are interested in reading yeah, more about that there's more so. that i didn't mention in here yeah there's a ton going on that's great um and then of course autism speaks has a no i'll, I'll shout yeah. out to them they're a non-profit so yeah obviously absolutely. Not, uh no they're a partner about that. yeah we love yeah. them yeah they're, they're yeah good so. stuff families uh there's a lot of good information for families it's mm -hmm. really meant for families although i use it all the time to get information too yeah um there's toolkits on there for families that have had a recent diagnosis there's toolkits ranging from what is aba to uh so that might help uh, uh the question from earlier mm -hmm. and then um uh, from laura beth and then also there's things on like toilet training or school or decisions about yeah. medications or all sorts of okay, things. great. Yeah. Well, we'll yeah. include a link to the research articles and you can check that out. So thank you guys for tuning in. Um, like I said, it is Autism Awareness Month, so we're so glad to be able to have you guys on to talk about this. I'll also put in a plug this week. Um, you can head over to Panera and buy mm -hmm. one of the Autism Puzzle Piece cookies. And uh, in our local Panera, that money comes back to support the Diagnostic Center mm -hmm. and to, to help these kids have more resources. So please go buy a cookie and They're support. Delicious. They are yeah. very, very good. So that's through um, the end of this week, I think, into the weekend. So and if you do get one, we would love to see pictures of you guys eating yeah. it. So thanks so much for tuning in. Have a good night, guys. Bye.